doing no deal seminar. Is happening at Columbia College, Chicago on April 3rd from 2 to 3 p.m. at the Ferguson Theater, 600 South Michigan. Our panel will include a behind the scenes look at the stories of the lives that run the music deal business. No on our guest panel, we have Lenny Santiago in from New York, York City, AR Def Jam Records, Left Hand Man, the El Presidente, Mr. Jay Z himself. We have Don DiNapoli, Street to Sweet Promoter, Holla at Your Boy in New York, our standard representative. Deal or no deal, you know, it's all about finding and making opportunities for yourself. If, if, if you can't find an opportunity, make an opportunity. opportunity. Kind of like that's what this event is based around. You network with people, that will create exposure, and then the opportunities come from that. Like, nobody's ever going to give you anything. You have to earn it. Uh, first panelist is Sean Murphy. My name's Sean Murphy. I work for ASCAP here in Chicago. I'm the Midwest representative. We also have Jeff Sotokoff. I'm Jeff Sotokoff. I started Platform One, primarily focuses on marketing and promoting and managing um, independent artists, artists that are signed to independent record companies and independent record companies. And uh, Lenny Santiago, he will be here. Yes, I'm the VP of AR for Rockefeller slash Def Jam Records. Um, a and if you're not familiar, is artist repertoire. I sort of serve as a liaison between the artist and the uh, record company. What were some of your life's changing experiences? What compelled you to enter this industry and when did you know it was your passion? I knew it was my passion, the, um, honestly, when I was nine or ten years old. At the, when I started learning about the music business, I definitely knew I wanted to be an A&R or in management. I just wanted to work directly and close to the artists. Um, Damon Dash and Jay-Z, uh, who I worked with at the time, you know, gave me the shot of becoming an A&R and I've been one for the last eight years. I knew very early on also, at that point, you know, I, I knew that I, I wanted to somehow be involved with music and entertainment. I'm a student of Newhouse Communications in Syracuse that I learned that you could actually have a career in the business and make money. Um, and that's when I really started to focus um, on, you know, gaining as much experience as I could in the business so that I was able to sort of distinguish myself. I grew up in the business. My father was a songwriter. Uh, my entire life I've been surrounded by songwriters. I grew up in recording studios. I, um, I've never known anything different. There was an internship available at the London office for ASCAP. I did the internship for about six months. I worked for free and I worked seven nights a week and I did you know, eight to ten hours in the office, and I did another probably five or six out in the club. Anyway, I signed all these big writers, um, so they made me head of the Midwest division. I've been out here for ten years. I think it's it's the greatest music. Scene. Prerequisites. Uh, did any of you guys attend a higher education institution? I know Jeff talked about that a little bit, and uh, does it really matter in the music industry? I personally didn't. Um, I had the choice. And I'm not saying this to anybody else to follow this to go to college and to go on tour. I think at the time it was with. Um, Chub Rock and the Hell of a Tone. I wanted to be in the music business so bad. I wanted I mean, to. I, I, you know, graduated from Newhouse at Syracuse, and you know, truthfully, it didn't really make a difference. It, you know, I was able to develop relationships in college that served served to be invaluable. Some of my best friends, you know, we all came out at the same time, and we were sort of a, you know, we co we were a, co a little coalition that helped each other out in breaking into the business. But outside of you know, developing relationships and you know, some experience, it didn't really uh, put me at any advantage. Do you feel like as an entrepreneur it helps you? Like having that? I think having a, you know, I, um, I, I, I definitely believe having a, you know, the college education that I have has been invaluable on so many levels. If I had to do it all over again, I would have a law degree. Um, everybody that I run into now that works in the music business is a lawyer, whether they're in the business affairs division or they're a manager or whatever, because, I mean, being able to, to look at a contract and understand what it is that, that that contract says, that's the essence of what we do. If you have any piece of paper sitting in front of you, you're gonna have to drop minimum of $150 just to have an attorney just glance at it and an attorney that's actually going to negotiate a deal for you can cost you a fortune or they're going to do it on spec and they're going to take 15% of whatever advance money you get. The attorneys are acting as intermediaries with music supervisors now. Um, I think they always have and they always will run this business. Uh, the basics of the industry. Uh, school is looked at as like a protected environment where you can take as many risks as possible. Uh, what are some of the risks that you guys took in your career and how did they pay off? I think internship was a huge risk. I was interning at record labels, too, sometimes at a time, one in the morning, 
went at night doing street team promotions, sleeping all, you know, I'm out all night, not getting any rest. I did it, I believed in it, it was a big sacrifice. And um, like I said, I set my goal and there was nothing that was gonna stop me. I think, you know, big risks are big rewards. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. I, I take risks every day. Um, I, I took huge, a huge risk the same in, in interning and providing my time and energy and services for nothing for a long time, not knowing what the outcome was going to be, um, but believing, believing in it, believing in the process, believing in myself. You know, I, I took risks while working for artists, you know, um, on, you know, risks on other artists' careers and, you know, developing marketing strategies. And I took risks, you know, I took, I think one of the, the most prominent risk I've taken in my life was leaving. I was the vice president of marketing and promotion for Columbia Records. Had a sweet deal, a great contract, huge salary, you know, killer expense account, this big machine behind me, all these major superstar artists that I was able to talk about to start my own company um, for, for way of life. And that was a huge risk for me and it was the greatest move I've ever made in my life. So. I firmly believe that, you know, you have to take risks in any business that you want to be in, in anything in life. And bigger, the bigger the risk, I think you could reap the bigger the reward. Somebody told me one time that planning is the natural process to success and absence and failure. Uh, how has planning helped you guys succeed by calculating risk? I'm, I'm very goal oriented in everything that I do. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big planner. Um, I believe in having a really smart strategic plan in whatever you're uh, choosing to do in your life. Every step of the, of the way, I, I, I formulate strategic plans, whether it be about my personal life, my, my, about my professional life, or you know the artists that I represent, um, you know, especially on the work side. I mean, I, you know, I think that it's incredibly important to have a plan behind a project in order for that project to succeed. I agree, hundred percent. That's what I live by: go, plan, and execute. The only thing I fail at is becoming a millionaire, but um, it's I'm in the plan. I'm, I'm, it's, it's in, in the, the plan. plan. I'm working on it. It never stops, you know, that never stops. I mean, if you're really trying to be productive, you know, you just gotta keep going. Like everybody, more like, do you have, you know, like the courage in you to to be who you see yourself in, at, in, your, in your dreams, you know? Yes, I am from Rockefeller, Def Jam, you name it, I've been there. Now I'm in the shop, coming to see what y'all got, deal or no deal. Along with planning, uh, multitasking and focus, and how does that fit in in your daily life? We're a, you know, a marketing company and management company, so we're dealing with all different types of artists, all different types of client, uh, products, brands, clients, so we're, we're constantly multitasking. I do, however, at the right times, give the appropriate focus. And, and I think that's really important. I think, you know, in today's age, when people are on the phone, they're doing the inter they're checking their emails at the same time, uh, they're working on some other document. I mean, they're, they're you know, doing three or four things at a time. Um, you know, could, it could affect, uh, you know, the impression that you make on that person that you might be doing a deal with or a building a potential relationship. I come from, uh, like I said, again, Rockefeller Records is an independent record company and um, you have to multitask. Everybody had five, six jobs. If you look back, um, if anybody's familiar with Jay-Z albums, uh, photography in every album, I have that credit. I a and r the albums, I have that credit. Um, one time, Jay's DJ walked off on us right before a show. I DJ from there, I DJ for him for the next four years. So I'm taking pictures. Uh, if you're familiar with any Jay-Z movies, um, I filmed well, the three that we did, I filmed two of them. So that credit, so you you have to do a lot. And um, everybody had to wear four and five hats. Grinding is like an essential part of the music business. Uh, what, what were some of the points in your life when you guys were grinding and it just seemed like you would never stop? I know when you're working your way up the ladder, it's it just seems like, you know, the days last 36 hours and that's the way it is. You know, I don't think I've ever stopped grinding. I think that the, you know, from the beginning, since I broke into this business to today, um, there's always an element of grinding. Get, you know, trying to get to a radio station event, or you know, to be there to you know, 
uh, do meet and greets for artists in, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of a blizzard, in the middle of the night, uh, being stuck on the side of the road for hours. You know, that felt like a grind. When I worked for Donnie Einer and Tommy Mottola um, at Sony Music, I mean, two of the most respected music moguls in the business, uh, you know, working for them, there's no doubt about it. It was hardcore. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And every day seemed like it was a grind. But um, looking back on it all, it was, you know, I, I don't think of it as a grind. I think of it as experiences that built my character because I did that. I, I, I was in those trenches, I, I paid my dues, I grind. It seemed like I gave out 8 million flyers and hung up 26,000 poster boards and it seemed like it would never end, but um, I, I did it, I kept going and the, uh, the best satisfaction about that now is, is seeing the people that saw me back then and saying, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you, you stuck with it. It's only like a grind if you're not enjoying it. It's a, it's a sexy business and everything and and it, you know, the payoff can be good. It, not necessarily, not 100% going to be. It's a gamble one way or the other. You know, not everybody that works in the music business winds up a millionaire. Um, but if you love it, like if you really, really love it, and you can't see yourself working anywhere else, and just the finding a new artist or hearing that new song that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, or whatever it is, if that is what makes your life complete. Um, then go for it. But what were some of the best relationships that you guys developed? That either from a mentor or from somebody that you came up with that turned to be extremely beneficial. I think in general, just in this business, relationship breeds success. It's a relationship built business. There's no doubt about it. For me, you know, establishing relationships with you know the most influential program directors at radio stations around the country for what I was doing, you know, in marketing and promotion for my artists. Establishing a relationship, you know, with the heads of programming at MTV, the big video channels. I mean, the, the catalysts that reached the masses, those controllers, um, were the relationships for me that served to be incredibly valuable. Also, you know, in order for me to start this company, establishing relationships with the artists and managers and agents and you know other entertainment lawyers and publishing companies. I mean. You know, that's, that's what this business is all about, is building relationships. Uh, you pretty much nailed everything. Relationships can get you almost anything you need. Relationships have gotten me a producer who charges 100000 20000 for my price because of my relationship. Uh, my relationship. Relationships can do from, you know, uh, introduce you to somebody to get you a job to uh, anything. They, they're worth way more than money. Uh, how important are setting goals and what are some of the goals that you guys are currently working towards? strategizing as far as uh, with a new artist or a new brand. We, um, Def Jam is uh, we're trying to develop a new brand as per se, somewhat like a, an asylum is at Atlantic or uh, somewhere like what a catch is where, you know, we can bring in artists who maybe do 50, 60, 70, 100,000 units independently, which is very good for them, you know, but maybe not so have that big Def Jam logo on it. Whereas, you know, is it, they, they, uh, people are waiting for them to meet high expectations since it's Dev Jam as, as opposed to it being an asylum or on Koch. So um, that's the next goal that I'm working on. So whole, that's the whole philosophy that behind the deal or no deal. Whether you got a million dollars in the bank or no money in the bank, do it with no money. Do it off, you know what I'm saying, pure determination, pure grit, pure will. Make it happen. Had, uh, that you met along the way and why do they stick out in your mind? What did they teach you? Um, my mentor outside of um, the people I've worked with directly is a man by the name of Big John Platt. He's um, vice president of BMI Publishing. He's a visionary. Um, just like how I always thought uh, Jay was a visionary and that's why I joined Rockefeller Records. Big John is responsible for signing just about any urban artist that you could think of that's incredible, from Pharrell to Jermaine Dupri to Usher to Alicia Keys to, to Ludacris to Jay-Z. I can go on, I'm talking about all top-notch people that he saw early. He signed Jay to a publishing deal in 96. Now, how many people would have known that Jay was gonna be Jay, you know, the biggest he was in 96? I have a few mentors. Uh, Chris Blackwell is one of my mentors. 
um, Chris Blackwell, you know, the same visionary, incredible business mogul, um, always an artist, you know, um, friend, which I think is very admirable, and an executive, Chris Blackwell, you know, obviously signed Bob Marley and U2 and uh, The Jam and Paul Weller. Um, some of my favorite artists of all time. I've always been told to keep your eye on the prize. Uh, currently I intern at two record labels, Atlantic and EMI, and I work under quite a few people, and I do their work, kind of. Has there been experiences with you guys where you've been doing other people's work, and do the big boss bosses notice that? Do they not notice that? No, I have a funny story. Um, coming up, I didn't, I didn't get along too much with um, Dame Dash, so I was always, Jay and I were always close. So. I would bring music in, or I'd be a new producer and new artist, and they would be like, oh, it's whack, get out of here, get that out of here. You know, I don't know if it's a spite or whatever. <laughs> so my partner, Hip Hop, which was, um, he was like the first day in our Rockefeller Records. Him and I were very tight, very close. Um, he now manages um, Kanye West and, and Lil Wayne. So anyway, Hip Hop, I would give the stuff to him, and he would love it. And then we strategize, and then the next week, I'd give the new producer to him, and he'd play it. And then when he played it, Dane would be like, oh my God, this is incredible. I love this. So you got, you know, um, I had to deal with that. So I, I, hip hop had to take the credit for a long time until um, Jay found out one day and then actually yelled at me like, how you not gonna let people know that's you? And I, I told him a story. He's like, I don't give a shit. You know, like, so it was a learning experience. I had to, I was willing to do again, sacrifice. I don't care, I'm not, you know, one for the credit. I just wanted to get in however I had to get in then. Hip hop wasn't trying to take the credit on purpose. It was just how we planned it, and it, it worked. I mean, I, you know, I'm in the business of doing other people's work, so you know, I I, I do other people's work every day, and I've always done. Um, I, I you know, I I can tell countless stories of how my bosses or the executives of companies would say what I had told them, you know, hours, even minutes before certain meetings. But you know what, I took pride in in that and, and didn't feel a scathe but yet felt more like wow they must respect me if they're using my ideas or my opinions um, whether they're giving me credit or not at the end of the day they know it in their own minds uh, I learned pretty early on just from watching other people if you try to snatch credit um, especially from your bosses before they have deemed it your time to get that credit they will cut you loose so fast mm -hmm. it will make your head spin mm -hmm. Because they want somebody that can be that they perceive to be a team player and somebody that makes them shine, and uh, and if you try to take any of that shine away from them, you'll be out of there. So. I, honestly, I, you know, to echo on what he was just saying, I, I think it's a, a stronger sign of character when you are making the people around you look better than you know what they normally would, would be, and that goes with any industry, what you know, any sport or anything. You know, the true superstars are the ones who make their team around them look great. How is like technology and new ideas help make your jobs easier or help develop new positions? Uh, the same MP3 technology that um, enables us to zap music around and save time and shipping costs and all that is also um, decimating record sales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's tough. It, for sure, it's made my job just as far as finding songwriters so much easier. The A&R process I think for most people, most of the kids I talk to at least, happens through MySpace now. There's a ranking system on there, we can go through the top artists on the, on the site from any locality. At the same token, we're facing massive challenges from uh, consumer electronics companies, from uh, cell phone companies, from internet service providers who are really trying to keep this whole peer-to-peer -peer thing going because it's driving so much business to them. Any of you guys would offer somebody an internship or an assistance position at Def Jam or Platform Woman or ASCAP, what are the qualities that you're looking for in that individual? Passion. Ambition, enthusiasm. The attitude. I'm going to sit with you for a couple of days, let you come hang out at the office, hang with you, see what you're about, see how much you really want to you know, be in music, what do you want to do in music, um, what your goals are. You know, I really don't want anybody who just wants to hang around because they think that, you know, my office is next to Jay-Z's, or they're gonna see, you know, Rihanna walk down the hallway, because you'll get a lot of that. But, Passion, um, enthusiasm, ambition, you know, and then smartness, you know, because at the end of the day, you are a reflection of me and my company. So, um, you know, we have a, a pretty intense internship program. Um, our interns are not fetching tacos and, and doing mailers. <laughs> they're actually working with our artists, with our clients on a day-to-day -day basis. 
um, in some cases represent the company with those clients. So it's important that they, you know, they're knowledgeable and they're sharp and, and you know, they're good listeners. Um, but, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, passion for music. The ambition and the attitude generally, um, attitude in particular, because it is such a, you know, personality, relationship driven business. Like, if you're not a likable person, I don't want you in my office representing mm -hmm. my company for sure. <laughs> but a pretty big internship program at ASCAP and we, um, have about, I guess, seven kids working for us right now, and it's their whole focus is to um, get out there and, and use the media and the internet to find artists that are coming up, whether it's through MySpace or through blogs or through magazines or th checking radio station websites or whatever, to identify those songwriters. And we educate our interns about the entire business of music publishing um, so that they can answer the questions that these people are going to have, and then we get them to reach out and develop relationships with these up, upcoming artists, up and coming artists, and um, we've had a couple of our interns have gone on to manage the artists that they they were dealing with. Um, we had three interns who wound up getting jobs in our New York and Los Angeles offices. So take this, take that, and apply it to your life. Deal or no deal. Take the story of King David. Take that story and apply it to your life. You know. This is for the people that felt like they could never get a chance or the people that felt like they were never heard or no one's listening to them. No, don't take that attitude. It's deal or no deal. Make yourself be heard. Experiences with artists or labels that you guys have had throughout your careers? I mean, I, you know, I, I have countless um, memories of incredible stories that are really what inspired me to stay in this business. That's, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I left that, that secure, you know, contracted job at a, at a record company was because of the artist. But, you know, being at Bruce Springsteen's house, hearing him and what inspired uh, The Rising after 9-11, uh, him playing those songs, that was a milestone moment in my life. Uh, we just did an interview with Zach Katz, I don't know if you guys know, um, he represents High Tech and J.R. Rod. I, I work a lot of production stuff. And the final note that he gave us in this interview was, you know, if you're, if you're not patient in this game, this is not for you. A writer last year, a guy named Adrian Marshall, he's Jamaican, he's like the coolest guy. And he wrote half of the Sean Paul's Temperature. Mm. And I I mean, I'd heard the song around and everything. I knew it was on the charts. But then I saw the year-end Billboard charts. And it was like the third biggest song in the country. Mm -hmm. Like the ringtone sales on this thing alone were off the charts. It was ridiculous. He got his first ASCAP check. And he called me. And just the, he was so happy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and choosing where I went to go with Rockefeller Records and Along the way, you know, Jay didn't really become big until uh, Volume 2, which is his third album. So along the way, you know, I still have my mother asking me what I'm doing and my grandmother saying, what am I messing with music for? And my mother or father would hand me um, applications for the New York Transit and just a whole bunch of that kind of stuff. And it's like, they really didn't get it. They didn't really know who he is. They didn't really probably even care who he was until, like I said, uh, Volume 2 came out and so six million records and it like changed everybody's perspective on who this guy was and who I worked for and where I was and that was the most rewarding thing for me. Getting with the local the people locally who are, I mean, I don't know if you know John Monopoly, they, there's always going to be somebody locally who's that much more connected, that much more in touch with people in the music business, whether it be New York, Atlanta, LA, um, than you are. Um, whoever the hot local DJ is, the hot local rapper. Um, uh, what is, are you a producer? Yeah. Get with the local rapper, you know, do track. Both of you are trying to meet the same goal. 
consider a good contract? Like, have you ever witnessed an artist sign a contract that they didn't understand? Or the most awesome one I ever saw was these guys gave up 70% of everything that they were going to get, in, including and all their publishing. Um, all the publishing. It was awesome, man. Like, this guy, <laughs> this manager fleeced these dudes, and this is a, a local group, like one of, the, one of the biggest local groups out of Chicago actually signed this contract. It was with a radio DJ that helped break their stuff here in town, and he got them under this management contract. And you got to remember, once you sign a contract like that, all the money goes to the guy who signed the contract. If you're a grown human being and you sign a bad contract, the courts are gonna look at it as, were you insane? If you weren't insane, then you obviously meant to do this thing, even though it's bad and it's not, you know, it's not the right, wasn't the right thing for you to do at the time. So all the money went to this, this manager, and so they had no money to hire an attorney. Um, they weren't able to take the thing to court, so it just stood like that. It's still like that to this day because they weren't, they didn't have the cash they needed to get out of the thing. So yeah, oh yeah. Do you think it was lack of not having an appropriate entertainment attorney with them? Or? Yeah, it was just like a, a lack of like a looking at the contract before yeah. they signed it, basically, yeah. What do you think is the, uh, <coughs> is the DJ in the uh, music industry? It means everything. Most of the best producers uh, were DJs. I mean, to me, on a hip-hop level, they, they, they're the nucleus of the group. They hold, they usually hold them together. Even on a personal relationship, uh, they make the tracks. Uh, they usually set. Mixtape DJs too. I think mixtape DJs are the best to break new artists. If you look at any region, DJ Drama helped break Jeezy. Uh, Miami, DJ Khaled broke uh, Rick Ross. In New York, DJ Pooh's broken 20 artists, you know, including Fabulous. K Slade broke Papoose. Like, DJs are the most, mixtape DJs are the most important, I think in breaking artists because um, everybody follows those mixtapes and once that DJ features an artist on there, one or two artists, the people, are, they're gonna follow suit. What's the best way to build a bridge and approach you? Um, to build a relationship from a, a, a businessman to another businessman right. perspective? That's why I come to these things. Mm -hmm. Just for these reasons, to get out, to reach out to the people. I don't sit in New York and just hope it's all gonna come to me. I travel anywhere, anybody calls me the drop of a dime. I didn't even know King David. He reached out a few times. He spoke. Uh, found out Don was involved. I have a great relationship with Don, and that's all it takes for me. I'm gonna be there regardless. Um, if you can, if I'm not in your city or your town, call up. Um, I usually try to answer most emails I get, or, or take you know as many phone calls as I can. But um, just ways like this. Got it. You got the connection. Now it's on you. There we go. All right, a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you for coming out today. We're going to stick around for a couple minutes if you'd like to come up and showcase I want to send a big shout to my man King David Goliath and my man Jay and even my man Mike on the camera <laughs>